I would like everyone to welcome really warmly Dr. Rajiv Party. So one thing she forgot to tell you that my full name is Raj and the last name is Party. So Raj in Indian language means the king. So all, I'm the king of parties. <laughs> In my previous life, when I used to go and see the patients in the morning, I would say, hi, my name is Dr. Party. They would not believe me. I had to have the nurse or show my driver's license that I am at least for sure Dr. Party. Because the patients used to think that I'm going to give them laughing gas, morphine, the good stuff. So I've named myself Dr. Party. <laughs> so today, my friends, I'm going to share an experience, my near-death experience which happened in December 2010. It's changed my life forever. What I drank, what I ate, even the simple things, where I worked, where I lived, my relationship with my wife, with my kids, with God, everything changed. Before you could uh, know what my, how it changed me, I would like to take you back to my background. I was born and raised in India to a middle class family. My father was an air traffic controller, and my mother was an English teacher. And I have a special bond with my mother. First, I'm the only son, and me and her share the same birthday. So my father used to tell my mom, what else do you want for a present? I've given you a son. <laughs> but my father was a very strict father, very strict. He believed in the old British saying, spare the rod and spoil the child. I was an avid student, but in my 10th grade, I got into a very bad company. I started smoking, I started drinking, and started watching movies during the school time. And one day I was caught. The principal called my father to the uh, school. And then I knew what was going to happen at home. I got the beating of my life. My father used a baseball bat, actually it was a cricket bat, and I couldn't go to school for three weeks. It was, but something in him also changed. That after three weeks were over, he realized what he had done. And then he started waking me up at four o'clock in the morning and making me study. So much so, I started standing first and second in my class. I became on the top. Then I started thinking of having a proper career. And for that, I have to get permission from the vice principal. When the, <clears throat> when my mother came, the vice principal's name I still remember was Mr. Sinha. And she said, my son wants to be a doctor and he wants to take uh, biology. And you know, Mr. Sinha was so rude to my mother, so rude. He said, do you think your son is going to be a doctor one day? And it brought tears to my mom's. And that's the day I resolved. I will be a doctor to wipe my mother's tears. And then, after studying first or second in my class, I went and sat for medical school ex uh, competition exam. It is one in 100,000 get selected, and I got selected in three places. Wow. Medical school was tough. I remember studying 16 to 18 hours a day. You know how tough the medical school is. And then, I became very spiritually oriented that time. I think I was in my second year. I even ran away from my house to become a monk. And then the president or the head monk told me, your time is not right now, go back, and your time will come. After finishing my medical school, I came to the United States to pursue more studies, to specialize in a different branch. I still remember landing at JFK airport on 22nd of October, 1982, with only $500 in my pocket. My friend picked me up, and we were four doctors in studying for the exam, living in a one-bedroom apartment. And to survive, I drove taxis, sold newspapers on the New York subway stations, and also worked as a guard. But taxi, I remember very well, because they tip, you know, after thing, and I would tell them that I'm a doctor, so as a sympathy, I used to get a bigger tip. <laughs> So after I did my residency at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, my daughter was born there, so I have a very close bond with Nashville, Tennessee. 
I came to California because my sister lives in Fresno. She, her husband is a cardiologist there. And then I was living in Los Angeles. I went to Bakersfield, just do a two week of temporary job we call locum. And I'm still there, it's 25 years. <laughs> it's hard, but I'm from a hard country, so I'm used to it. Now, my life became an American dream, but American dream became a runaway American dream. It was every few years a more expensive car, a bigger house and bigger house. There was no limit to it. I call them the toys I was running after. My last house was a 10,000 square foot house on a golf course in a lake. And I drove expensive cars. I had a sports BMW, my wife had a sports Mercedes. And as extreme uh, uh, SUV, I had the Hummer to go with all these things. I was a bad boy at that time. <laughs> You know, it only gave eight miles a gallon, but I didn't care about the environment that time. I still remember, especially if a small car used to cut me off, I used to go behind them. And a poor guy would see a tank coming and just move away. But inside, something was missing. The fulfillment was not there, no matter how many toys I bought, how big a house I built. And then my life was very stressful. Also, as an anesthesiologist, one gives, I was specially specializing in cardiac anesthesia. For that, we stop the heart order. <coughs> and after the surgery is done, we jump start the heart with like two jumper cables. You know, the heart starts beating again. But sometimes, no matter how hard we try, the heart does not start and the patient dies. But we have to go and tell to the family what happened. That used to be so painful. But we have another wish to school, uh, put to sleep in a half an hour. And so I never had the time to process my own emotions. I had to go out and now give a case, do another case, like happy, smiling for everybody. So when I used to come home, days I was not on call, because I don't want to jeopardize anybody else's life. I used to start with one scotch. One will become two, two will become three and then I'll go to sleep. That was my stress management by, you know, drinking. And my typical day used to start early morning. At six o'clock, I would be rushing to the hospital. With one hand, I would be drinking coffee. With one hand, I'll be also taking a sandwich, eating a sandwich, and then talking to my stockbroker, because the New York stock market opens at 6.30, you know, and then also talking to the nurse about my first case. This was multitasking at the extreme. And of course, I was driving too. <laughs> so my life was continuing like this, you know, not fulfilling from inside, but from outside, it was at least very fulfilling anybody who saw my lifestyle. Me and my wife were sitting in our backyard and admiring our golf course and the house. Especially we were talking how far we had come with only $500. And during, I forgot to mention that during my residency, I came to America as a single, I got married. It was a semi-arranged marriage. I went to India twice, and my father had selected about 15 girls for me to choose. We, but we had a choice. Me and my wife could say yes or no. And then, the first time I didn't like any. And then the second time, my wife was number fifth. I literally fell in love with her in half an hour. And we said, let's get married. I only had two weeks vacation as a resident. And then I saw her for the first time on 29th January, got engaged to her on 31st January, and got married to her on 12th February. <laughs> that was fast. And then my mother, as an assignment, as if she's giving me an assignment, says, my son, I want to be a grandmother soon. <laughs> and I said, mom, don't worry, I'm working very hard at it. <laughs> and I, we, me and my wife, had a baby boy nine months, nine days later. <laughs> You're fast. <laughs> I, I, I worked hard. <laughs> we were having sipping tea when the phone rang. On the phone was my urologist, Dr. Chang. He said, Raj, are you sitting or standing? I said, no, I'm standing where I can sit down. He said, there's a good news and a bad news. 
you have prostate cancer because it was a diagnostic test done because PSA, which is a screening test for prostate, uh, had doubled in one year. He said the good news is that it is in early stages and it can be removed with a radical prostatectomy, taking the whole prostate out. But the bad news was that you have to go through surgery. So I was in a state of shock. It felt like the earth below my feet had moved. And then I spoke to my wife, what happened? What's the news? So next day, we went to see Dr. Chang, and we decided the best course was to get a surgery done. And we found the best surgeon was in Florida, who did it laparoscopically without opening the whole body. So we got the surgery done, end of August 2008. But the surgery went fine, but it left me with a lot of complications, like chronic pelvic pain, repeat scarring, not being able to go to the bathroom, incontinence, impotence, and it was very, very stressful. And for chronic pain, I was prescribed narcotics. You know, Oxycontin, Vicodin, and I got dependent, and then almost, or not almost, I was addicted to them. And I was the one who used to write these prescriptions as a pain management specialist and as an anesthesiologist. And then this all led to depression. And depression, is, if somebody has not gone through it, is very painful, very painful, you know. I was on three antidepressants at one time. Three antidepressants. And repeat scarring required lancing or taking the scar out repeatedly. And I had seven surgeries in two years. The last surgery, <clears throat> was in December 2010. That was a surgery done to place a special device so I could control my bodily functions. But that surgery went fine again. But two, three days after the surgery, I started having fever, redness, and swelling. And the swelling progressed and progressed. I had the surgery at UCLA, so on Christmas Eve, I had a fever of 105. I was trembling like a leaf, and I could not go to the bathroom. The doctor told me to come to UCLA hospital right away. And from Bakersfield to UCLA is about a two hours drive. My poor wife, around eight o'clock in the evening, is driving, crying, was in a mess, and I was equally in a mess. It was one of the most excruciating, painful ride I had. When I went to the hospital, they put me on very heavy-duty antibiotics, IV, vancomycin and gentamicin. But still, I was not getting better. There was not enough time. And so they had to do emergency surgery to take the device they had put out and also to clean me up. So when they did emergency surgery on Christmas Day 2010, after 15, 20 minutes, I saw myself looking at myself about 10 to 12 feet higher. I had an out-of-body experience. My first reaction was, as a man of science, did somebody put some LSD in my uh, <laughs> anesthesia? <laughs> and actually, there is a drug, anesthetic drug, which we use on kids for you know, burn dressing changes, ketamine, which is almost like LSD. And I was wondering why would he use an, a, a ketamine or LSD on me? So, I saw myself about 10, 12 feet high, and I saw my body, the surgeon's cutting it open, and uh, cleaning me up. And from there, I would love to say I went to a very serene place, but that was not the case with me. I went to a realm where there was fire, thunderstorm, lightning in the sky. I could hear other souls crying and wailing. And I was taken there kicking too. I didn't want to be there and it was smelling of burnt meat. And then I was wondering, why am I here? What have I done? While I was asking these questions to myself, the realization was given to me that so far my life had been totally loveless. I had been mean. I would be always snatching things, not caring for others' feelings, not have empathy for my patients. I, apart from anesthesia, I had a huge pain in my regular practice too. I remember a 70-year-old lady once coming, came to my office, and she had arthritis, severe arthritis. But she wanted to talk to me, spend some time with me, 
you know, because her husband was dying of cancer. But me, in a rush, just wrote down a prescription and walked out. That was so bad of me. Now I wish I could go back. But that, I'm not doing those things now. But that was my nature was. So while I had this uh, revelation to me, why I'm here, I felt sorry that I wish I could change the things around. And then the health started fading away. My father showed up. And my father, like a little boy, me, took me towards the tunnel. And my father, the same father who abused me, was not there to help me. And he said, he gave me words of wisdom. He said, my son, if you keep your consciousness clear and you're truthful to yourself, the divine, the universe will take care of you. And these are the exact same words he used about 20 years ago when he died of heart surgery in Fresno. And I have forgotten those words. In the, he walked me towards the tunnel and in the tunnel, I had the past life, I had a review, not only of my present life, which started in the health realm, but also of my past lives. Two past lives I was shown was one as a medieval prince. I was a, again a cruel prince, was whipping poor farmers with the a a cane and also asking the soldiers to do the same thing. And this was the same life I had actually seen about five years ago in a workshop with Dr. Brian Weiss. I'm sure you must have heard about Dr. Brian Weiss. He's the pioneer for past life regression. So in that uh, workshop, when I saw myself as a uh, medieval prince, I went back to the farmers and asked for forgiveness. So in my present life, I went back to the previous life and asked forgiveness. And luckily or coincidentally, I didn't know what to make of it, in two weeks, my hand pain went away. I have a scar from here to here, and I was able to go back to work, which I had not done for six months. What you make of it is up to you, and I also didn't figure out what it was that helped me cure my hand. Now, coming back to my time in the tunnel, I also had a review of my present life. You know, we started as I was mean, uncaring, unloving, you know, always grabbing, snatching, how I could be. From there, my father left me to the tunnel and I went to the other side. I was greeted by two very robust young men. And I was wondering who are they? They told me telepathically, they are my guardian angels, Michael and Raphael, which I later on found out more about them. Raphael is the angel for healing pattern for doctors, and Michael is for strength. When I told this to my wife, her first reaction was, what happened to the thousands of Indian gods? None of them showed up. <laughs> because, we have, because we have a god for family, we have a god for country, we have a god for state and city. We have thousands of Indian gods. At one time, it was estimated the population of the gods and goddesses was more than the population of human beings <laughs> in India. So from there, these angelic beings guided me towards a light being. It was like thousand suns <clears throat> blazing at the same time. But strangely, the light was very calm and soothing. It didn't hurt at all. It was bluish white light. And in that presence, I was made to realize that my life would be fine. I'll have to go back, but my life will be totally different. I will have to lead a very spiritual life. I'll have to give up my career as an anesthesiologist and be a healer of the soul, as Barbara mentioned, and be a nice person now. That's my second chance. And then, while I was listening, actually it was more of knowing, some words flashed in the sky, which read A Course in Miracles. And being a Hindu, having raised in a Hindu uh, environment, I had no idea what they meant. Later on, I found out that it was a, metaphys it's a metaphysical book popularized by Marian Williamson. So while I was there soaking this love, I could, my, all my five senses were soaked with love. I could hear love, I could see love, I could taste love, I could 
or else smell, uh, smell of, <laughs> you know. And then I suddenly woke up in the recovery room with a job. My first reaction was of gratitude. I wanted to go down on my knees and thank the divine for a wonderful experience I had. Then the anesthesiologist came, and I verified with the anesthesiologist that he had told a joke in the surgery. But I can't tell you guys the joke because it was not a clean joke. <laughs> <laughs> and me being an anesthesiologist myself, I, I know part of the job of an anesthesiologist is to keep the environment light and tell the jokes. But before I do that, I want to make double sure the patient with, uh, with anesthesia gas is totally asleep. <laughs> you know, because hearing is the first sensation to come back and the last to go. So from there, that was my reaction in the recovery room. And in 72 hours, I was fit enough to go back home. So they discharged me on oral antibiotics. But I still had wounds, which would take a few weeks to heal. But my life totally changed. Started Things started happening on, on their own. For example, a plastic surgeon friend of mine came to see my, me, but then he liked my house so much. Then he said, I want to buy this house. My house was not even on sale. And then we wanted to, as instructed by the light being, we wanted to down, you know, make life more simpler. But he had a house, a moderate house to sell too. So without any real estate agent involved, we just switched our houses. I sold my Hummer. <laughs> and, and then my expired, my lease for my sports car expired. So instead of getting another sports car or another uh, toy, I bought a Toyota Camry, a hybrid. So my life literally and figuratively went from Hummer to hybrid. <laughs> More ways than one. Yeah. And then, in th but one thing, my wife didn't change her car. <laughs> she still drove the sports car. <laughs> then, within three, four weeks, I resigned as an anesthesiologist. I was the chief of anesthesia at Bakersfield Hospital. I was, as I meant, I was not good to the patients, but technically, I was very good. I loved my job. It was up to me. I would still be doing anesthesia and not talking to you guys. But now, I feel it's an honor, it's a blessing that what I went through. And then, my life changed in every way you can think of. I became regular in meditation. So instead of drinking for stress management, I started meditating regularly. And food-wise, I'm a Hindu, you know, like, I used to eat beef before, which we're not supposed to eat as a Hindu. I stopped eating beef. And then, what I watched on the TV also changed. Previously, I used to watch all crime shows, forensic files, cold cases, <laughs> you know. But then I realized, without me making a decision, I was hardly watching any TV. But when I was watching TV, I was watching Food Channel, Travel Channel with my wife. <laughs> food Channel, you know. But it's actually a very good channel, you know. It makes you feel <laughs> So everything changed. My nature changed towards my wife. It became a more spiritual relationship. And we have been married for 25 years. And we just had our 25th anniversary. And I surprised her with the trip to Paris and Venice. It was a very remarkable trip. Just two of us. You know, our kids, I have three kids, boy, girl, boy. They all have left house. They're all in college now. And once one morning I got up, and my wife was still sleeping. And I have never done this before. And that was the last time I wrote a poem. Aww. And I, I just read a few lines from that. I have my wife's permission because, you know, it's a poem to her. What is love? Love is when you are there, then the world, then the world is there. Nirvana, the ultimate bliss is there. Love is when standing in the DMV line together, a couple has more fun than others have on their honeymoon. <laughs> Love is when it is like two different flavors of ice cream just want to melt together. 
Love is when being together is like smell from the earth when it had been dry and now the first rain falls. Mm -hmm. You know that sweet earth smell, grounding smell. Love is when being together, the time stops and you feel this is it, it is heaven. Love is when holding hands and running on the beach feels like being one with the universe. And then, love is when you feel that on this journey called life, your soulmate has been found. And I met only my wife once before. And in the end, love is when in spite of all efforts, including those above, you give up and say, you are love personified, otherwise I cannot define it. And this is my post-NDA transformation. And so much so, one day, I even sent her flowers. And she said, why are you sending me flowers? It's not Valentine's, it's not my birthday, it's not my anniversary. And I said, because as long as I'm married to her, then every day is a Valentine day. But I don't want to keep sending her flowers, then she'll have an idea, you know, why is he guilty conscious or something? <laughs> Is he parting too much? <laughs> so my personal life was transformed and changed. But at this other, professionally, as I told, I gave up my job as an anesthesiologist. I started writing, I started speaking. I did a course in meditation at Chopra University, you know, Deepak Chopra's. I did a course in Ayurveda, which is an ancient way of healing, about 5,000 years old and it is all nature, consciousness-based way of healing, living in harmony with the nature, with natural cycles. And then I started reading the Course in Miracles. And from my own experience, I came up with three words which became my mantra, forgive, love, and heal. And as I say, one does not have to have an NDE to follow this magic formula. Forgiveness is a very big thing. And forgiving one's own self is even the hardest because to some extent I used to feel I should have known better than getting addicted to pain medications. And then I was very mad at God when I had the diagnosis of prostate cancer and all the complications I had. Quote, unquote, I had to forgive God. Sure. You, know, you know, like why? You know, I was mad at Him. And then I had to forgive other people who had wronged me. So forgiveness is a very big thing, and forgiveness is letting go of the resentment. It is not reconciliation, it is not condoning it, but letting go of the resentment. If we carry that baggage, we may still be hurting and still be crying, but the person who hurt us may be in Hawaii having a good time. <laughs> So, and this forgiveness is for one, our own self, it's not for anybody else. It is not a just simple word you say, I forgive you, but it's a process and it takes time, it takes courage. It's something inside out, not outside in. Job. There are different ways of forgiveness. One is to change the perspective. In myself, I learned to do that. I actually named two people in my personalities, poor Rajiv and lucky Rajiv. Poor Rajiv is the one who had cancer and who had to go for, through the suffering, sold his house, sold his cars, and this was le leading a modest life. And lucky Rajiv is, he's totally free of any financial burdens. He is leading a, the life he wanted to live. He's following his purpose, he's following his dharma. So whenever I get depressed or when I'm angry, I say to myself, who do I want to be? Lucky Rajiv or poor Rajiv? <laughs> and then there are other ways of forgiving too, like writing a letter. But I don't recommend mailing the letter, but pouring your heart out. I wrote a letter to my dad because I had mixed feelings because of the abuse I suffered as a child. And then other method is to take a piece of stone and put it on your heart, a heart chakra, and give all your pains as if you're transferring your anger to the stone, then throw it away and walk. And I actually like walking out to my coaching clients. I tell them to do it near a water body. Like then you are symbolizing baptism. Like when you come out of the water body, it'll renew you. and You've left your anger, your resentment back. 
these are one of the few methods I recommend for forgiveness. And one equally important is yoga and meditation. In meditation, you connect to the deeper source inside that helps you get rid of anger. And my own relationship with divine changed after I forgave, quote unquote, God. I became more trusting, more believing. Like, I used to have a vision board before. You must have seen the movie Secret. Yeah. I saw that movie and I made a vision board for myself in a house in Malibu, on the beach, a Lamborghini and all those things. But after my NDE, I literally took that board. It was made of biodegradable. It was paper, biodegradable. I floated it in the ocean. It symbolized to me, the ocean symbolized to me, the vast, pure, unformed consciousness and me as a wave in that ocean. That, oh God, I do not know what is good for me. I surrender to you, whatever you want. Make me be happy in that. You know, it's something like serenity prayer, you know, where you ask for the wisdom to know the difference between the two things you can change and things which you can't change, and things which you can change, cannot change, to have acceptance for that. The next word which comes is love. And love is this I'm talking about unconditional love, which you love for only reason is love. And love is a verb. For me to experience the first unconditional love was when my son 25 years ago was born. When I saw him for the first time, I felt deep unconditional love that he is here because of me, through me, and I'm totally responsible for him. It brought me pure joy. And that is the love I'm talking about. And there's another kind of love I want to talk about is seva. <coughs> seva is a Sanskrit word, which means service with gratitude. Now there's so many of the Sanskrit words, like chakra, karma, pandit, are becoming American mainstream. And one of the words I want to recommend should be equally followed is seva. Actually, Ram Das, you know, an American, you know, you must have heard about Ram Das, you know, in the spiritual circles. Even his foundation is Seva Foundation. And that's what it is, service with gratitude. I'll give you an example about the Seva. In 1980, I had gone to Munich to give an exam so I could come to the United States. After giving the exam, I was tired. I was watching a show on the streets. You know, in Europe, they have shows. And then, I left my passport bag, which had my passport and ticket in it. I realized that about 10 minutes after I had the show was over, I went back and I could not find it. I was in a new country with hardly any money. What to do? A person walks by me who looked like me. So I went to him and I said, Sir, are you an Indian? He said, No, I'm a Pakistani. And I moved back. Because we Indian and Pakistanis have fought five, uh, three wars since independence. We were one country one time, but we split because of religion. We still fight, but that time we had just had a war in 1965, 71, uh, in 1971, and there's always some border fi firing going on all the time. So I walked away, but that guy was a gentleman, very well dressed. He came to me, he said, you seem to be in trouble. Can I help you? I had no choice. He seemed to be a very genuine guy. I told him what my situation was. That guy took me to his house, gave me food, gave me shelter, and next day he even took the day off to show me Munich. I still remember visiting the old Olympic Stadium. And when we came home, my passport ticket was there because he had made a few phone calls and the police had found my passport and ticket. Now for that guy, what he did to me was just pure seva. He did this just for doing it, not that he's going to get any reward from it. You know, it was just doing it. That is what seva I'm talking about. And another form of love is when you share it, it grows. For example, I knew a lady, Charlene, who was married for about 30 years. She had, and her husband had a foolish shop. And the husband died of a heart attack. She lost all hope. Her business was going down. She had nothing to live forward to. And then one day when she comes home in the winter time, a lady, old lady is sitting in her porch and saying, Diana, Diana. And the lady was freezing, so she took her inside, gave her some warm blankets, gave her some hot chocolate. 
And then she figured out where the lady was from, from a nursing home nearby. She drove her there. But it does not end there. Then next week, she went to check on her. And then she took flowers with her a week following that. And then she started taking flowers and visiting at least two, three times a week. Not just that lady, but the whole bunch of ladies. And she got known as Flower Girl. She brought so much of joy to everybody that her own life became more fulfilling again. It brought her joy. This is by sharing love, it increases, it multiplies. So we have forgive, we have love. And then comes the healing. The healing happens at four levels, physical, mental, social, and spiritual. Like with physical, if one is leading a good life, there's less stress, there's less chance of a heart attack, there's less chances of stroke, less chances of uh, high blood pressure. And then at the mental level, one's free of headaches, one has less addictions, and one has less depression, like things I had to go through. And then at a social level, it brings fulfillment and joy. And I have seen in my own experience as an anesthesiologist in the hospital, when the patient had a family sport, you know, with a lot of people coming and visiting him, that particular person would go home much earlier than somebody who had no love, and they healed faster. Because with love and with seva, the good hormones like prolactin, DHEA, go up. I was going to say oxytocin, but I was going to say <laughs> oxycontin. I said no oxycontin, but oxytocin. Oxycontin is a narcotic, <laughs> very potent narcotic. And then the quote unquote stress hormones, epinephrine, non epinephrine, they all go down. <coughs> That's biochemically one can measure in the blood. And the modern science is even proving that how it works, because there is something the modern science has discovered is neuro, neurons in the body which are known as mirror neurons. Like if I move my hand, about 30% of the same neurons in your body will also fire, in your brain will fire. If I'm feeling pain, you will feel pain. And the beauty of seva, of service is, the person who is doing seva, person who is receiving seva, of course they benefit. But the third person who is just observing this interaction also equally benefits. So seva is very, very important. In the healing, as I mentioned, there were four parts, physical, mental, social, and spiritual. And to have that wellness at these four levels, I wrote my first book, Soul of Wellness, which describes how to achieve that. It's based on 12 principles, and the 12 principles are acceptance, you know, harmony, you know, stress management, exercise, the divine you, spiritual wisdom, it is available for sale there. And then, my friends, as I said, when I was in the uh, NDE, during my life being, I was told, my time is now to be healer of the soul. So my question to you is, my time is now, when is your time? And in conclusion, I, it has been a very long journey so far from abusive father, to addiction to fancy cars, to drugs, to houses, and of course my NDE. But one does not need, I'm repeating, does not need an NDE to have a fulfilling life and following the mantra, forgive, love, and heal. I say forgive easily, love passionately, and heal quickly. <laughs> and I say, in my previous life, I used to put people to sleep. No, I wake them up. <laughs> Thank you. Talks about the ground. Yeah. 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 You know, like this is the most common question I get asked. You know, like one side I'm saying God is totally unconditional love and everything, 
then why did I have to go through hell? Is it really true or not? And that I'm still trying to integrate in my own life, how to balance these two apparent paradox. Like as the previous speaker was saying too, there are a lot of paradoxes in the other field, on the realm, which is trying to balance. For me, it was real. I had to go through it. But ultimately, what I feel, one goes higher and higher levels, like uh, Dr. Alexander talks about too. Then everything, hell and even heaven is an illusion. What really exists is the pure light being, or which we are parts of. You know, my mom, she, she had cancer, but she kind of died a, a, a bit of a slow death. She often had to get chemo and stuff like that. And I was there at this time, but my brother and dad, they, she never would let them leave her alone, mm -hmm. day or night. And uh, she was, uh, you know, screaming at times, and she seemed to be going, and, you know, my interpretation is that she was going in and out, and, and that what she was experiencing wasn't her mom and dad or loving friends that had already passed over. She was a bad person in my view, and I believe that she was experiencing hell. But prior to your thing tonight and then Evan's talk, I mean, I'm well read on this field, and mm -hmm. I've never heard anybody talk about the house, so I kept thinking I was wrong about no. thinking that maybe I was talk about my mom or through her. I've never said anything to anybody because I'm sure that happens. That there are what 20 percent of the NDs are uh, scary, you know, are you know like hellish experiences. What? One lady, Nancy Bush, has written a lot about it. Who is? Nancy Bush. Bush. Nancy hey. Evans Bush. Yeah, Nancy Evans Bush. Yeah. Nancy. Yeah. Okay. What are your thoughts on the career path that you chose? Is is eventually brought you to your knees? Yeah. Have you, you must have thoughts on that. You know, I do have thoughts. You know, as I said, you know, I was the chief of anesthesia at Bakersfield Heart Hospital, and I loved my job. I was passionate about it. But the time comes when the dharma, the purpose changes. Like in the light being presence, I was told to lead a more spiritual life, life to share and serve, not just run after money. And I, I meant that here you were, you made a career of giving people drugs, and you ended up being, that is what also made you, uh, and, and, you know, detached. Yeah, and that gave me, opened the door for my realization. And you're very right, this nowadays, you guys, you all may be surprised, this oral prescription medication, narcotics, is a much, much bigger problem than the illegal drugs. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, yeah. Then illegal drugs. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go over here first, yeah. and then we'll come over here. Sure. Yeah. You talk about God. I'd like to know what God was to you. What What did you experience? How do you describe God? You know, the God I experienced was like a light being, a swirling light being, like the previous speaker was also mentioning. And I experienced unconditional love and intelligence. That's what what I experienced and felt. And that's what I believe God is. I think this God is beyond, is a force, is energy, which is beyond, you know, a religion, you know, spiritual religion. It's not like a, a white man with a beard sitting or one of the Indian gods like Vishnu or Shiva. Though they are all forms of God and one can pray to any form of God, like I, as a Hindu, pray to Shiva, but ultimately the God is totally formless. And then the other question was, uh, how does your family took your near-death experience? Okay, yeah, that's also I get asked, and that's one. My wife was very supportive, and because especially things started happening, like selling our house, because selling a three million plus house in Bakersfield, California, is very hard, <laughs> very hard. And how it got sold without even putting on the market. And as I mentioned, my nature changed. I became a good husband and a good father, and that's what, what made more important to her. My daughter also is very supportive, but my two boys 
they are kind of agnostic. They don't care either way, as long as I pay their bills and their <laughs> tuition. Maybe they'll come around. They'll come around. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Did you ever get clarification as to why Michael and Raphael were your main guides on the other side, what that was about? No, I, I personally think because Raphael especially <coughs> is the go, uh, angel of healing right. and he's the patron angel for doctors. That's why I think he showed up. And Michael, because I was weak that time, you know, emotionally d depressed and everything, so Michael showed up as, I think he's the in charge um, uh, also, that's the reason I feel. But now I studied about archangels from Doreen White's uh, workshop, you know, from Hay House, and the four archangels. I call, though I'm a Hindu, I call them on very often. You know, Raphael, Michael, Uriel, and Gabriel. And today, for my speak, I literally requested Gabriel to be with me yeah. because he is the <laughs> uh, angel for speaking. <laughs>